very active observation collapses the wave function. Yes. Keep thinking of it. Thinking because of it. there's an intimate connection. Oh my god, that's so weird. Cool. Whoa, 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 whoa. Oh my god. What happened? What happened? What the oh. f Do we create our reality? The big question is, what is reality? That's a, that's a huge question. We suppose there is such a thing as an objective reality. And one of the ways that we determine what objective reality is, is we ask a lot of other people what their reality is. And if it coincides, we say, okay, you know, I have a correct reality. I am connected to reality. But it's, that starts to get weird really fast when you get into it. Is there an objective reality? Or is the reality from your point of view? <laughs> Think one, not the, not the eight of diamonds. It's a very low card, yes. It is a low card. It is a low card. Okay. Go ahead, say it. Three of diamonds. Oh. Oh. Well done. Oh. Thank you. Basically, well grow up conditioned and possibly even not conditioned, but just part of our nature to associate the registration that we receive from our senses as the way it is, as this is the world. Mm -hmm. And so, can you talk about the relationship between what is perceived and the perceiver? Uh, we can get into it philosophically, I suppose, but really, the import is in gaining a little space. And by space, I mean where, yes, we are uh, habituated into assuming that the information that our senses give us is accurate, you know, and that it represents reality. And that is why I think as people who watch a magician, for example, that we're intrigued by having our reality challenged. Watch the deck. If I move the deck and I try to restore it, all the cards start to vanish. Except now I'm left with only this one. Oh, Which means <laughs> we thought we knew how this was going to go. And we thought we knew that, you know, this card was going to be this or this was going to be there. And suddenly it's not like we thought we knew it was going to be. And that, in a, because it's so non-threatening, delights us. Mm. <laughs> ah, you know. And... But it does loosen things up a little bit. And this is what, you know, the teaching is, is really about. To loosen things up a little bit. So that there is the opportunity to recognize maybe a deeper truth than our senses give us. And that we assume to be true as a result of our senses. Well, you understand that, right? Uh, 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 wait, wait, go up, go up, go up, go up. No, how the f What the f I know. That's not fair. Wait, wait, we've never met, right? No, hold up. This, this is magician weird. is straight chugging me, dog. Hold up. What the f Oh, I'm getting finessed, dog. If I had money, this would be over. Don't worry, man. It's what all about where you look, man. <laughs> Can I show and you how you look. Else?
Okay. This is about that too. Can you take one for us? All right, right here. Right here? Okay. Right take a look at it. Good. And just right all over the car, like all over it. Yeah. Perfect. No other card like this exists, yes? No, you could hold the marker for a sec. I'm gonna give you a piece of this, okay? Have you heard of this experiment called Schrodinger's cat? Sounds kind of familiar, right? Schrodinger's cat was this thought experiment, but there's been other experiments, double slit experiment. It's basically been determined that you can't really tell what something is or where it's gonna be until it's looked at. You can't really predict what something's gonna be until it's observed. So I need you to imagine that these pieces that you're seeing right now, All right. these are the potential of the card. You can't really tell if it's whole or if it's in pieces. All right. This is just its infinite potential bouncing back and forth. Big enough? Yeah, the moment that you look at it, you don't really know if it's ripped or if it's whole until you look at it and then it becomes whole. Take a look, does it match? No, that's not, what the? Yo. Yes. Yes. Oh, you see that? <laughs> what the right. but we'll do something without cards, I'm okay? Like sure. We're connected to everything. The fact that we have a body and we think of that as being separate is actually not true. We're connected to everything, things that we interpret as inanimate. You want to see something crazy? But we don't perceive how it moves. That's why I think in my architectural practice, we're like, do you understand that your, your environment is not just this, this shell of something that you sit in and you bring people in and it's not active with what you are doing? It's absolutely active. It's not active in living and breathing in the same way that we recognize as humans, but that's a human-centric vision. What is this concept of that totality is not linear. It is a holographic view of existence, a holistic view of existence, that everything is connected to everything else. Even time, even past, present, future. Exactly. They are all part of the wholeness. And as a pointer, it, its value, as far as I'm concerned, rather than being a subject for discursive thought, is in opening you up to another way of seeing. So a fresh looking at things in which you may be able to recognize something far more profound than your discursive mind can reckon with. Did I ask you if you believe in time travel? I met your future self and it created a paradox. You know that card that she signed? You know you've had it on you this whole time, right? Well, you have it somewhere a magician gets accused of hiding cards. Where does a magician hide cards? In their sleeves, right? I should have gotten up here. What the fuck? We gotta go! 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 What exactly did you mean by a holographic model? That everything is contained in everything else, basically. Have you ever heard of alchemy before? Yes. It's the art of transmuting something. Because the essence of everything is located in the tiniest grain of sand. So if you change something's like structure, you could change it into anything else. So what I'm going to do is just kind of roll this up a little bit. Do any of you have a lighter on you? Light the lighter, go ahead. What the, what the f Oh, how did it turn to water? Oh, you oh, no, 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 depending on how that sensory apparatus filters what's coming in, no one knows what's really out here. There's really no way of perceiving the true thing because the very act of perception is an augmentation to what is. Is that an envelope? Uh -huh. That is an envelope. That's really what it looks like, right? It really is. Okay, can you take one for me? Take any. Okay. 
Can I take one? Well, you did last time, right? So here, show everyone what it is. Daniel? Where is this? Where is this so-called envelope going? In your pocket. That's really what it looks like, right? You really believe I gave you an envelope? Let me take that. <laughs> relax, relax. Is it in your pocket? Can you see it? What do you see happening right now? Tell me. The truth is, I've had the envelope in my hand the whole time. You're hypnotized because your mind creates your reality. I gave you a deck of cards that I put in my pocket. You still see the deck of cards in my hand? Listen, wake up. Are you ready? Three, four, five. Wake up. Oh my god. <laughs> oh my god. And I wasn't lying, What's inside in the pocket, pocket is the duck of cards. Oh, that's so weird. Can I try? Remember we used to talk about the bank account that we make when we're kids? Like every belief mm -hmm. that we have, you can, you can treat it like it's an investment in a savings account. Oh yep, I, I believe I can't do that. Ching, money in the bank account. Ching, ching, ching. And we build up this huge pile of investment that we've made in our beliefs. And it creates this mask, it creates this face, it creates our persona, our identity, who we think we are in the world. But to access the kind of creativity that's really interesting to me, we have to understand that that identity is just that. It's a thing that we've built. It's not who we are. And so the awareness practice that we practice ourselves and we help others practice is to actually detach ourselves from that identity. We start reclaiming all of that energy that was socked away in that bank account. So if all of our thoughts are being generated from this very limited fraction of the potential of understanding of what we are, then, that, then that's the result that you get. But if you can detach from your identity and kind of connect to and imagine and create from that broader point of view, well, imagine what you can create. Imagine what you can see. Imagine doing this without LSD or without other mind altering agents. Hopefully you have, we have somebody who shows us the way. All of us have had somebody that's come before us, but then we can use the energy we've reclaimed to reclaim more energy and more energy and everything we've locked away and fixed in that identity. Look, in, inside the pocket is the Mr. Card. It's a collaborative thing. I hope so. It I is. I hope I'm a part of this magic. You are. This is happening in your mind as much as it's happening anywhere. Can you take one for me? Oh god, I'm scared I'm messing up. Don't be afraid. You won't mess it up. So again, this is a demonstration of the power of thought, the power of belief and idea. Okay? It doesn't matter if I see what your card is, but let's just say you wrote your name on this, right? Yes. Let's just say this card identifies you. Okay. Yeah? Our ideas are thoughts they can have this quality of kind of holding us down. Yes. Give us a, a false sense of self, if you will, okay? The goal of a lot of spirituality is to kind of free yourself from them, strip those away, and in that sense, you start to become sort of lighter. Oh my God! You start to become lighter, you see? The goal is to strip, like the, goal, the goal is to strip those away, right? One what? by one. The goal of spirituality mysticism is to kind of strip away, look through the veils of the ideas you have about yourself. When you start to do that, you actually start to become lighter. You see? Much lighter than you were before. You strip your ideas away one by one. One by one. You have a different sense of yourself. It's coming closer and closer to that understanding now in science that the mystics have had that everything is one thing, hmm. everything is one energy. And my understanding now is that so are we. Hmm. We are mm -hmm. that energy as well and we, we do uh, fluctuate in vibrations. If we're, if we're going to talk on a purely scientific metaphysical level we draw similar frequencies to us to, uh, within life circumstances, within people, within, within all those kinds of things. And that's kind of my understanding on, on a scientific metaphysical level mm -hmm. of how we create our reality. Here you go, partner. Yo, oh yo. My God. Put it here, brother. Yes. Put it here, brother. <laughs> Respect that.
Have you ever heard of the law of attraction? It's the idea that if you want something or if you want to become something, you have to feel like you already have it. And then you draw it to you. And so the essence of your thoughts and emotions is reflected in your reality. Is this anything like your card? No. It's different? Mm -hmm. So this card's dream is to become like your card, okay? Was your card red or black? Red. red? It needs to start thinking like it's a red card. Wait, wait, it's well, a listen. Red card. Wait. It needs to start, because it's a red card, it needs to start thinking like it's a diamond card. What the oh, what? Yeah. No. I'm assuming it's a number card, right? Uh -huh. It needs to start thinking like a number card. Oh, oh, oh this isn't a number oh, no, card. No, no, no. It that, that. Listen, it doubted itself. It was pretty close, though. Can you go like this for me? Look. Was it this one? No, no. no. Is it close? It's yeah. close. Look, look. From this point, all it takes is a subtle shift. What the? Yo, you see the fog? Yeah. Wait, how? Wait, how? 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 Wait, how? 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 Wait, how? 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 What? It literally changed your face with my eyes. What? That is so crazy. <laughs> I see four quarters. With this hand, can you push them together? Like this, so they're stacked. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Perfect. Let go. Now. Have you heard of the law of attraction? Power yeah, of thought? Yeah, yeah. Everything here started out as a thought. Of course, All yeah. these buildings, everything you see around it, our shirts, these coins, yeah. it's incredible. It manifests. I want you to pretend like you're picking up a coin and putting it in my hand. With this hand, pretend to pick it up. Close your hand. You really imagine? Your thought was made manifest. Take a look. What do you There's have? No way. There's only three quarters. Take a look. <laughs> But we'll do it a little bit differently this time, okay? How much do you see in your hand right now? Four. Four? Yeah. Push them together. Let go. I, all I want you to do is pick one up and put it in my hand. Actually pick yep. one up? Actually pick it up. Okay. Giving and receiving are one in truth. You, you believe this? Yes, sir. Look how much you have. <laughs> you have four. How many do you count? There's four. Can you pick up the top point and put it in my hand? Close this one. Thought can be deceptive, yes? Take a look. Uh, there's four there. You have your very practical, acceptable psychological understanding of how the mind affects how you perceive things and how you quote unquote color things, which is huge. And to be able to detach from that and see everything that you've believed. Now you have this added dimension of understanding that in that sense, you've been creating your reality this whole time. You've just been doing it unconsciously. You've been drawing all these things into, but through everything that you've believed. Your mind creates your reality. You've heard, you've heard that before, right? You could take that on many levels. You could say that you're, you give meaning to everything you see, right? You ever look at the cloud as a kid, or maybe even now, and you're like, oh, that's like a horse. Then someone else sees something different, right? Touch one with your finger, anyone you want. This one here, I'm not even gonna take it out. Okay. I'm just gonna show it to you. Don't tell me what it is. You got it? Got it. This is obviously not it. Right. What quantum physics has discovered that until something is observed, it exists in all potentials. The very act of observation collapses what they call the wave function into a singular reality. This is gonna be kind of a plan then. I'm just gonna draw a bunch of dots and lines on the back of this. You'll have to tell me if this looks like something or not to you. Okay. Does this look like anything to you? Not immediate. Well, remember, your mind creates your reality. Which potential do you want to select? What is the name of your card? Keep it in your head, don't tell me. You have it in your head? I do, yeah. Intend to see it. Believe that you'll see it, expect to see it, and you will start to kind of Collapse oh. the wave function. Oh. Your card exists in all that 52 possibilities at once. So it doesn't really make sense, right? But the very act of observation collapses the wave into a singular reality. Get the f out of here! Get the f So now someone has this awareness. What then? What do we do then? I think you have to... The, the next natural step would be to deal with the fear of that. Okay? The fear that you're responsible for creating everything in front of you. 
okay, and, and interacting with it, okay? The fear that your identity isn't all that you are. Now, the way that the ego takes that is, aha, I will now manipulate my perception to get what I want, to make my reality what I desire it to be. But in this teaching, this living teaching of Advaita, what we're looking at is, does the ego have the power to manipulate your perception? If you do, then by all means, manipulate you know, your fortune and your fame and your happiness and your health and your success. Uh, But if you find that you're having difficulty with this, <laughs> perhaps it isn't a matter of simply that you haven't mastered the technique. Perhaps there's a fundamental flaw, which, and this brings us to the question of your personal power, your ability to, from your own inherent power, influence your perception. And it gets tricky because sometimes you can. Sometimes you decide, I'm going to change this, and, and it changes. But the fact that it's not reliable, the fact is that you can't do it 100% of the time, means that there must be some other factor at play. And that's recognizing that is the opportunity to begin to investigate what that factor is. What is happening right now? <laughs> is this... Oh, it's the one you signed. That's kind of weird. Do you believe in free will? Relativity implies that everything that's ever happened or will happen is happening right now. Okay. Quantum physics would take it a step further. Every possibility for everything that's ever happened or will happen is happening right now. Perhaps based on the choices we make, we determine which probability we experience. I believe that. Then a neuroscientist would come in and ask, okay, but who's making the choice? Because they've determined that many actions we take are made for us seven to ten seconds before we're even aware. The brain seems to have made the choice. There are instances, though, where it seems that people are able to tap into certain probabilities and predict accurately what was going to happen. Psychics, they say, are able to do that. There's also been many novels that seem to predict very accurately things that happen in the future without having any prior knowledge of it. Have you heard of Wreck of the Titan? It's a novel, one of many novels that seem to predict with eerie accuracy the sinking of the Titanic. There's a ship called the Titan. It's deemed unsinkable. It goes in a similar path, crushes into an iceberg. Most people die, not enough lifeboats. Well, I have a page out of a novel here that might predict something's gonna happen. Can you take this one? You have completely free choice, or so it seems here. Which two objects do you want to pick up? coin and the pen. You're sure? You don't want to change? This is for me? Yes. Okay, this goes into the pocket. Out of these two, which one do you want to keep? Which one do you want to give me? The pen. You're positive? <laughs> yes. Okay. That's very odd. I will have a pen, you will have a hold of the coin, and there's always the card that gets hidden out of sight. <laughs> 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 Out of sight. <laughs> oh my god. Oh my god. Thanks, nice. Thanks man. That was very Thank nice. Thank you. <laughs> That's really weird. <laughs> Ramsu knows this. You are perfect. Your every defect is perfectly defined. Your every blemish is perfectly placed. Your every absurd action is perfectly timed. Only God could make something this ridiculous work. I came into spirituality in a kind of roundabout fashion, I suppose. For 19 years, I was an alcoholic and a drug addict who 
firmly believed that I was the master of my destiny and I had complete control over my life. And uh, then one night at the end of these, this 19 year period, uh, without any desire or warning for me, uh, this compulsion that I had had all this time to drink and use drugs was removed from me in an instant which left me with a bit of a existential dilemma. If I was the master of my destiny, how could this have happened? Because I was truly transformed. The essence of suffering, as far as I talk about it, is in the sense of being an independent entity gives rise to guilt, it gives rise to hatred, it gives rise to projected fear. All of these kinds of things are linked inextricably to the sense that I am an independent entity, separate from you, separate from the world, independent of everything. And as something that is independent, I therefore have total responsibility for my actions, my thoughts, my feelings, everything falls on my shoulders because I am it. What is crucial to understand is that this sense of being independent is false. There's nobody here! We, in fact, are not independent that we are an intrinsic aspect of all that is. We do not exist independently of everything else and everyone else, that we are linked in the most profound way. So this is the what the teaching is pointing to recognize. Not to believe, or not to understand, but to recognize for yourself, to see what you are, whether or not you are an independent entity or an aspect of the wholeness. And only you can inquire into this and only you can potentially recognize what is true. What do you, what do you see in the cup? You see water, I'm assuming, yes? Yeah. Okay. They were really <laughs> this water, let's just say it represents everything in the universe. It's one ocean. And before the Big Bang, if you're familiar with the theory, yep. everything was still and flat. Yep. Then the ocean starts to go into movement and it creates waves. And the waves are the phenomena, the trees, you, the fountain, everything is a wave. Where are those waves? You and me are waves, animals, trees, lamps. But humans labor under the illusion that we're separate, independent droplets of water, of ocean, they begin to feel heavy. See? <laughs> but keep holding it for me, okay? She's like, You see nothing in my hand? Laboring under the assumption that we're separate, independent droplets of the ocean. When we, when we believe this, we start to feel heavy, isolated. You feel like it's everything plus you. It becomes a very scary world. Of course, world. the only way to truly find peace in this instance is to realize that the droplet never existed. Jesus Christ. Oh, I swallowed it. To find true peace, you have to realize that that's been an illusion the whole time. You can't be a separate, independent droplet. The objective is often to free yourself from that notion. The only way to find peace is to realize that you're not a droplet, you're just a wave. One with everything. That was actually touching. 
I think what we experience as our life right now is a blip on a line that's longer than we can imagine. Because I think there's a part of our consciousness that exists beyond what we're aware of in our physical bodies. So we have this enormous creative potential and that goes back to kind of just understanding what influences our thought process and what we attract to ourselves based on our thought process. The way I, I see uh, these teachings about manifestation now, it's as if I'm studying electricity and we can observably see that when we really kind of start to study the nature and the workings of something, we often start to relate to it in a different way. We start to quote unquote use it. That's such a big difference than I think the way most people take it. You take it as an assertion of your own personal independent power. And I've been there. Rather than seeing all of these occurrences and metaphysical happenings as the mechanism through which your reality is created. And because I've been exposed to this now, if that comes up, there is often an opening that comes through, the teaching comes through, if you will. The tightness goes out of it, out of the need to control, but the fascination with it is still there, the fascination of exploring all the different subtleties of it is still there, and then I'm left with much more energy to potentially direct a thought in a particular way, or if I want to make a visualization or something, I have more energy to do that. Mm -hmm. The seeming paradox, of course, is that when this is seen through, all of a sudden you, you appear to have much more energy to deal with life in an effective manner. Yeah. Well, you have a lot more energy to deal with to life. Deal with life. <laughs> <laughs> I'm now able to say, yes, you create your reality, but what are you? So we draw the experiences to ourselves that we need to heal, to understand, to grow, to stretch. Maybe that means suffering. Maybe that means bliss. I think to be human, we have to experience all of those things. To just say, all I want is the sweet side of things, then how do we know what sweet, be, what sweet is at that point? And it doesn't mean we choose to dwell in suffering. I think all of us deserve happiness and to know peace and all of those things that we aspire to. But that only can be known if we've tasted the entire palette of options. We exist in a realm of relativity. Nothing here exists without its opposite. Without up, there'd be no down. You wouldn't know down. Without hot, you couldn't know cold. Without dark, you couldn't know light. There was no basic, you couldn't know me. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> if you didn't know darkness, you won't know love. That's right. Got it. You, you completed my sentence. Right this one here? Yeah. Don't want to take it out. I want you to keep it in your mind. Can you see it as well? Can you see yeah. me in the dark? Yeah. I want you to imagine the number of the letter glowing in your mind. You have it? And you have the suit next to it? Just keep thinking of it vividly. See, that card, being the light, is grateful for the darkness because it knows <laughs> that without the darkness, it would not be able to see itself. The light is grateful. Watch. The light is grateful because it knows that without the darkness, it could not see itself. Uh, listen. What? Imagine it getting brighter and brighter. That card's desire is to know itself. That card is grateful for the darkness because it knows that without the darkness, it could not see itself. Is that it? Hell yeah. yeah. How you do that? Oh wait, what? <laughs> what? <laughs> what? <laughs> oh, oh, what? If there's some bigger play that's going on that we don't have access to, at least all the time, 
but how we respond to what crosses our path is what matters. So if we think we can't, then we can't. But I've seen a lot of people that think they can't and everything ends up on their door anyway. So what else is in operation there? So not all of it can be known. I don't think all of it is to be known because I think we have to take the risk to stretch. If we knew everything at the outset in this construct that we've created for ourselves, then there'd be no learning. I think it's always just a little bit beyond what we think and we have to take a risk and we have to stretch beyond where we think we can go for the next bit to be revealed. Monte Alban, this ancient site in Oaxaca, Mexico, is built on a plateau and it was the governing center of the sort of Olmec culture in southern Mexico centuries ago. It, you know, it had some leadership structure at one end. There was the largest pyramid and that's where the leadership was and it was the other end was the kind of foundation and the wisdom where the elders lived and the teachers lived and then there were eight equal pyramids that bound this plaza. One of the pyramids is gone now so if you go there and you look you'll see the history says there's only seven pyramids. There were eight there and those eight pyramids represented the eight states that came together as a collective to make this culture. And the one requirement of the leader of that culture was that she or he could speak all eight dialects that came together to create this culture. That leader didn't expect for those people to come and speak her or his language. That leader understood that she, he needed to actually speak their language. And what's even more remarkable is that each pyramid reflected the sort of economic generator of each of those regions. Some are very modest. Some of these palaces, these pyramids are very modest and some are huge and exuberant and you could see were probably covered with all kinds of expensive things. And, and they all existed equally on this plaza. They all were who they were, and they all came together to create this collective. Now that's really fascinating. And I think actually, I'm hoping we're awakening to a time of that kind of self-organization, where each of the eight, or however many there are, can be themselves, can have equal voice, there's just a little bit of structure because you need a little bit of structure. It doesn't mean it's better just like the head and the lungs and the heart, right? You need all of them. If you don't have lungs, you can't live. If you don't have a heart, you can't live. If you don't have a brain, you can't live. So which is more important? It's sort of a futile discussion. So imagine a culture organized in that way. That's super fascinating to me. Coming together in, in a way that embraces everyone's individuality. Exactly. And recognizes everyone as an integral part of the whole. Yeah. And so, in order for that kind of awareness to come through, that whole veil of that identity that we've accumulated, that sees itself as essentially separate from everything else, on so many different levels, mm -hmm. on compare, through comparisons, on better than, worse than, I'm worse than, I'm better than, those people are worse than me, those people are this, those are that, and the continuous conflict that arises from that identity. So, so now you have people coming into, coming into the recognition that that is just conceptual structure, that there could be so many different ways to look at this. You start to get this sense of expansion within yourself of how flexible everything can be because your point of view can be that way point of view can be so flexible. You, you get an expanded sense of yourself, how you can be this flexible being mm -hmm. throughout the world. Yeah. And you start to then understand why people would do what they would do, and you, and you understand that you wouldn't act any differently if you were coming from their model of the world. Yeah. And from that, the need for conflict diminishes greatly. And you could, and you could start coming together, you could start having conversations. Yeah. You could start communing. 
but also for your, on an individual level, you start to see how much power you've had to create this hell on earth that you've created via the power of your point of view. Your single point of view? Your single point of view, <laughs> exactly. On a collective level, if you get a sense of expandedness and of unity, then that's probably the point of view that's gonna, that's, that's right to approach this political situation or whatever. If you're, if you're talking on a personal point of view, if you're looking at it from the point of view of something bad that just happened, quote unquote bad, you failed at something, but you're able to look at it as a stepping stone and you feel that sense, now you're more in alignment with the desire that you have, which oh. is to be happy. When one realizes that we're all connected and these are all points of view around the same evolving consciousness, then it becomes harder to see that as separate, that as separate, because it's not. I dreamed that I played shuffleboard with Gandhi, okay? And during the shuffleboard thing, he kept changing the rules. And he kept changing them and altering them. Um, and at the end, you know, he said to me, you know, and I was being very, I was getting very frustrated, okay? Because he was winning, okay? And at the end, I said, why did you keep changing the rules? And he said, how else can you affect change in the world if you don't make change for yourself? Okay? And it was so amazing. And so I played shuffleboard with Gandhi so he could show me that the rules could be changed. Okay? So that the world could be changed. I want to get you in on this, please. Come here, come here. <laughs> Oh. Where was it? <laughs> oh, oh my god! Have you heard the saying you need to be the change we wish to see in the world? Yeah. Keep it somewhere I won't lose it. No, I'm not. <laughs> but wait, I, no, no, I need you for one more, one more. Oh my god! <laughs> it's something Gandhi said. And it's rooted in the understanding that what we believe to be the exterior reality is an extension of ourselves. What we experience politically, socially, economically is an effect caused by personal and mass belief. So everything that we experience collectively is a reflection of mass consciousness. Have you seen this film? Do you have a favorite scene? No? This is my favorite scene. What? But there's more to life. My favorite scene. What the? What? Check it out. Is that a normal spoon? Yeah. <laughs> Big and bold. So, you need to be the change you wish to see in the world. Right now, the world is still largely a reflection of separation and fear, but things are changing. When you start to move away from the separation and the fear, you will notice that the world will move with you. The world can't help but move with you because the world is an effect. When we start to move collectively away from the separation and the fear, the world will start to move with us. The world can't help but move with us because the world is an effect. And you'll notice it's never the world that really changes. It is merely yourself. The world will move with you. You'll notice that the world can't help but move with you because the world is an effect. You'll notice that it's never the world that changes. It is merely yourself. As you move away, the world can't help but follow your movement. And you'll notice that it's never the world that changes, it is merely yourself. And eventually the old world will become so unstable. Oh, man. No! <laughs> I'm not even gonna try to figure that out. <laughs>
My fellow sorcerers, let's drop the act. This is a big magic show, and you're pretending you don't know the tricks. Have you forgotten? You're the magician. How will you end the coming act? Will your illusions bring joy or sorrow? Will you remind your fellow magi of who they are? By sharing your wonder with the world? illusion is also your greatest gift. Use it to look within and rediscover your greatest secret.